Those that may not have encountered the forum before, I'll provide a little bit of information about the forum. Um, it's an international organisation that works on policy issues and practices dealing with federal and decentralised government. It's uh, supported by 10 partner governments and works um, in two principal ways, uh, in research and policy issues, as well as development assistance programs, which uh, it supports around the world in countries like Ethiopia, Philippines and Nepal. Its core motto is learning from one another. Um, the Climate Governance and Federalism Project, um, which we're uh, talking about in part today, uh, began a little over two years ago when the government of Quebec, through the Quebec Secretariat of Canadian Relations, or more correctly, and please excuse my French, uh, Secretariat du Québec aux Relations Canadiennes, provided um, the generous financial support that has made this project possible. The research project and book, um, which will um, result from the research and work that uh, has been taking place on climate governance and federalism, addresses the integral role that systems of governance play in addressing the climate crisis around the world. When we consider that the majority of the world's largest emitters, emitters are either federations or have adopted systems of decentralised governance, we begin to comprehend the importance that federal systems play. This uh, research addresses several key questions around the role that federative entities and other actors play in the effort to mitigate the effects of climate change. This kind of thinking explicitly enshrined in the Paris Agreement, which recognises the provinces, states and municipalities have a critical role to play in contributing to the realisation of climate mitigation and adaptation, is very much the focus uh, of this research, which tells the story of how governments across jurisdictions interact with one another to address climate change. Essentially, it's talking about the dynamics of climate governance. It brings together 22 leading scholars from around the world to shed new light on the concept, complex relationship between federalism and efforts to combat climate change across 14 key jurisdictions. In the study, those uh, 14 uh, countries are Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, Ethiopia, uh, the EU, although it's not a country, uh, Germany, Indonesia, India, Mexico, South Africa, Spain, Switzerland, and the United States. That brings us to the panel today, which in part brings together part of the research as well as contributions on this important issue. We will hear today from uh, on the Australian case presented by Professor Alan Fenner, on Switzerland from Dr. Marlena Camerera and Professor Sean Muller. Uh, from Germany by Dr. Peter Eckersleys, on China from Professor Araz Teha and Dr. Lily Lee, and potentially California and Quebec by Charles Bethlet. After these uh, presentations, we'll hear from our discussant, George Stairs, who will be work who's been working on this project with the forum uh, since its inception two years ago. Then on to what I hope will be a very rich discussion. One last uh, housekeeping matter before we begin. Um, we have been uh, asked to adhere to very strict guidelines around time for each presentation. Uh, each um, paper presentation should be 15 minutes and no longer. And as chair, I will strictly adhere to that. So please uh, do keep uh, that 15 minutes um, in mind. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, and so without any further ado, um, I'll ask our first presenter, Dr. Alan Fenner, to please begin his presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Phil. This is great that we're finally having this panel that I think was discussed a few years ago and, um, and uh, uh, great for organising it. I'll begin with um, a couple of, of observations about federalism. First of all, I'll say I'll keep my story pretty simple pretty simple, in fact, err on the side of oversimplifying rather than overcomplicating, but just for the point of getting the, the essence across. So the, 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 um, the basic observations I was going to begin with, I think, apply to all uh, discussions of federalism and its relation to policy, and that is that federalism has widely varying effects on policy, depending on, in particular, the type of 
federal system it is, the underlying or the politics that interact with that federal system and a range of other variables, but also the type of issue concern. So federalism has very different effects on some issues as existing from other issues. And I'll talk about a little bit of that, that in this context. I think it's, uh, my conclusion is that in recent times, we've had two major issues in Australia that tend to uh, illustrate of the two general tendencies, let's call them complicating policymaking and facilitating policymaking, that these have illustrated the propensity or ability to, of federalism to facilitate rather than complicate policymaking. And the two events I'm talking about, most of you will have heard about um, the COVID pandemic, uh, and the second one is climate change. So I think in both of those instances, we've seen federalism working in some ways to, to um, facilitate policymaking rather than to obstruct it. There's a lot of discussion, for instance, about some of the ways in which federalism may complicate and obstruct policymaking, including problems of uh, lack of coordination between units, both vertically and horizontally, uh, and the tendency perhaps for uh, one level of government to block action at another level of government. On the facilitating side, the, uh, the observation is that federalism can provide alternative venues for policy activity. It can provide opportunities for experimentation and learning. Uh, and so that that is what I, tend to, I see more of in both the COVID and the greenhouse uh, gas emissions um, policy areas. So the Australian situation, very briefly, uh, Australia is regularly carbon shamed for the uh, degree of per capita emissions it produces. It's, it's one of the highest, it's certainly the highest in the developed world in terms of per capita uh, uh, carbon emissions. Um, and at the same time has no national carbon pricing scheme to rein those emissions in. So it's, it's seen as being a somewhat recalcitrant uh, international player in that regard. This reflects the fact that Australia faces the classic dilemma of a resource rich economy uh, with abundant uh, natural resources, uh, including abundant energy resources uh, that form the basis for the great wealth of, uh, of the country. Uh, and more specifically, Australia has relied on its enormous reserves of coal, burning enormous amounts of coal to generate electricity, not only for general consumption, but also for fueling a, a number of major resource um, processing industries for export. So burning coal to generate electricity is Australia's number one source of carbon emissions and has been fundamental to the economy for a long time. So this create, does create a real dilemma for the country, particularly given that Australia's coal resources are enormous. And I mentioned in the paper that uh, the most offensive form of coal, brown coal or lignite, Australia has approximately 1,000 years supply at current rates of consumption. So it, it's hard to turn you back on, on, a, on a windfall resource of that nature. The other side of the Australian dilemma is that Australia makes in total, even though very high per capita uh, contribution to global uh, emissions, a trivial overall or, uh, or absolute contribution to uh, global emissions. Less than 1.5% of global greenhouse emissions come from Australia. So Australians are aware that no matter what they do, it won't make any difference to the state of the world. So that, that's the, the, the dilemma that Australia is in. Of course, the amount of coal it exports produces three times as much as Australia's total emissions mainly burnt by countries like China, who of course the big offenders when it comes to global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now the other side of the ledger for Australia, for, for some people the good news part of the story, is that Australia is also one of the world's uh, best countries for renewable energy resources, solar and, and wind power. So that's that certainly uh, makes it easier in some ways to um, for policy change. It also is a particularly vulnerable country to what is predicted to be the effects of global warming. It's already a very marginal ecosystem and climate. Uh, most of the country is basically uninhabitable uh, and more will, it appears will become uninhabitable or difficult to inhabit 
as bushfires increase, as temperature increases, uh, if, if indeed the waters, the oceans start to rise, since most Australians live within walking distance of the beach, if they can, it it's all makes Australia acutely aware of how vulnerable it is to, is to those changes. It also has the benefit that unlike Canada, it's not stuck with an enormously valuable but horrendously painful resource when it comes to global emissions like the tar sands. So uh, while burning coal produces a lot of emissions, uh, producing it doesn't, unlike the tar sands in Alberta, which very much complicates political economy there. The other thing that does help the situation in Australia is that Australia is, is much, has a much less regionalised political economy of resources than many other federations. So uh, Australia's uh, hydrocarbon resources are pretty well distributed around the country. So that's the, the, the underlying situation. A lot of this dilemma that Australia reflects, uh, uh, experiences is reflected in the partisan desire, divide in politics. So the centre-left tends to uh, favour taking action and the centre-right tends to uh, uh, protect the existing comparative advantage that Australia enjoys in hydrocarbon resources. So there's, there's a, been a pretty pronounced um, not unambiguous, but pretty pronounced partisan divide over this issue, which is key to understanding the role of federalism in the story. Of course, each party has contesting elements within it, and the Labor Party, which is the leading party on the left, uh, has strong elements in the union movement who are wedded also to the old hydrocarbon industries. So there, there's conflicts within, within each of the sides of politics as well, but generally there's an overarching partisan divide uh, on the issue. So when it comes to the relationship to federalism, the important point is that both levels of government have almost full capacity to take effective action. It could occur at the national level, it could occur at the state level, both have the, the constitutional resources uh, and, and power to do most things that are that, that could be used or employ most instruments that could be used to mitigate emissions. There are some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, uh, either or both levels of government can take effective action on this issue, which, which then you can start to see why the interaction between the partisan divide and federalism comes, becomes terribly important. So on the, the centre right, the coalition parties in Australia, as they're called, uh, have governed nationally for all but six of the last 25 years. So this means that at the national level, there's been a very strong break on taking action, mitigation action. <clears throat> and this is reflected in the fact that Australia has no national carbon pricing scheme. Uh, and obversely, the, the uh, centre left, the Labor Party, has tended to govern much for much longer periods at the state level. So the partisan divide is reflected in quite in a, quite a pronounced way in federalism between the two levels of government. So for the first period, while the the um, Conservative parties were in office in Canberra nationally, uh, the the states were all Labor, uh, and they built considerable momentum towards policy mitigation policies, particularly shifting towards the tra transition from coal-generated electricity to renewable electricity. Then when, when the Labor Party took office for six years from 2007 to 2013, it took on board a lot of those policies, indeed introduced a national carbon pricing scheme um, and substantially beefed up the renewable energy target and so on. Uh, but as soon as they were... Uh, turfed out of office in 2013, the, car the Conservative parties immediately unwound the carbon pricing scheme and abolished it. So the partisan divide was very clear there. At the same time, Labor was coming back to power in the States, picked up the baton and, and moved much more aggressively towards uh, in the direction of policies that would, that would um, support the transition to renewable energy. The most, the clearest case of this was the state of South Australia, which admittedly is one of the weakest in terms of hydrocarbon resources, but it's moved rapidly to um, to renewable energy uh, and has been at various times running, various days running off 100% for the state's new renewable energy and aims now to have by 20 something, 2040 maybe, 
um, producing 500% of its consumption uh, by renewable energy, obviously exporting the rest. So the that partisan divide, as I said, reflected very clearly in federalism. Federalism has provided the opportunity structure whereby uh, climate change policies that have been blocked at the national level uh, have been incremental, incrementally introduced, obviously with varying degrees of enthusiasm in the different states, depending on the conditions of each state, led by the Labour Party, but not exclusively uh, achieved by the Labour Party uh, at, the, at the state level. And these have gone a long way uh, to bringing about that electricity energy transition that is the cornerstone of any fundamental change that Australia makes, particularly if the transition to electrical power in other sectors is part of the conversion away from uh, um, hydrocarbons, then the, that electricity itself has to be generated, obviously, by renewable power. So the, the end, the, the takeaway of this is not the claim that federalism has produced a better outcome than might ideally have occurred in some people's views, um, but federalism has provided a backstop or a, a, a sort of a safety net for policy making in this regard whereby it, policies that, as I said, that are rejected at the national level have, can be and have indeed been pursued uh, at the state level. So the, the end, the, the, and the, I think the interesting thing about it is that finally is that this has been done by states acting on their own, not acting in concert most of the time and not needing to act in concert. As long as each state does their thing, as long as each state carries its share of the load, it doesn't really matter how little or more they, they coordinate either with, with the Commonwealth government in Canberra or with other states. So it's, in a sense, it's traditional federalism in action. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fenner. Quite an interesting case there when you talk about the recalcitrant, recalcitrant uh, country, but with an opportunity for a lot of uh, renewal and federalism providing a bit of an opportunity to achieve that, although the partisan divide um, is a bit cumbersome for, for Australia. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, moving on, um, we next have the um, Switzerland presentation going to be done by Dr. Marlena Kamara and uh, Professor Sean Muller. Thank you, uh, Marlena and Sean. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm going to present uh, alone, but uh, Jean is here for any questions then after the presentation. Uh, so welcome to this presentation. Uh, it's a co-authored uh, chapter. My co-authors are Karin Ingold and Maria Gallmann as well. Jean Muller is here. and. Um, Yes, um, the first question that uh, arises when you think about Switzerland is probably, I'm sorry, I have here troubles with my slides. They're not moving now. Okay, uh, so is Switzerland a leader? Um, internationally, certainly Switzerland is often perceived as a climate leader. It performs according to the um, Climate Performance Index of 2021, not bad. Uh, it's, uh, it's ranking now on place 11 of 61. If you, you see it on, on the little figure here on the left-hand side, uh, very tiny in the middle of Europe, it's green. So there's no country which is very good. So it's at least in, in the rank of the good countries. It has ratified uh, the Paris Agreement already in 2017. It has uh, a rather ambitious um, reduction, uh, emission reduction target promised in its nationally determined contributions of 50% by 2030 in comparison to 1990. And it's also rather active internationally, for example, by um, being part of the Environmental Integrity Group. Um, on the national level, however, it can also be considered to be a laggard. Um, currently, it has reached 14% uh, um, emission reduction in comparison to 1919, but it has promised 20% by 2020. And the biggest problem is here, as you can see in uh, this um, light uh, brown line on the very top of the graph, uh, the traffic sector or the transport sector. Um, 
but the picture is not yet um sorry okay i'm sorry i have ah no okay i'm sorry i'm not figuring out this uh, uh slide system here so on the federal level uh the key policy is um the swiss uh, federal co2 act uh, the act is already from 2013 and the commitment period was uh, actually ending in 2020, um, but it has been extended due to um, a failure of uh, the actually planned revision in the context of uh, the Paris Agreement. The key instruments of this act are a building program, a CO2 tax on combustibles, a compensation of oil imports, a Euro, um, Europe, um, the uh, linkage to the European emission trading system, and the standards for cars. A problem of this act is actually, and this is also the reason why uh, Switzerland is doing so badly in the traffic sector, is that the measures in the traffic sectors are rather weak. For example, there is only a CO2 tax on combustibles, but not on fuels. Uh, and then also the emission standards for cars, they are oriented on the EU, they could be higher, and the compensation of oil imports is actually also something to compensate for the CO2 tax, is not doing the job as uh, it should. Big controversies in Switzerland are traditional, they are traditional in, in that sense that they are usually affecting the traffic sector, and this has something to do that the traffic sector is also affecting the, the voter and the voter in Switzerland due to the direct democracy has a lot of power. Um, and also interests are organized very well in Switzerland along um, for, uh, uh, for the, in, in the economic sector um, and also in the energy sector. For example, the oil uh, industry is very strong here in, and has very strong interests also in, in, in climate change. And a further controversy is also that the degree of flexibility in where to um, implement the measures that is within Switzerland or abroad is a big discussion. Uh, so in the aftermath of the ratification of the Paris Agreement in 2015, Switzerland actually started to revise its CO2 Act, but this, the, this, uh, the Act is, um, failed twice. It failed first in 2017 in the Parliament, and here it was a so-called unholy alliance of, uh, not real alliance, but um, a, a position uh, of both sides. Actually, the um, Switzerland's People Party, like the right-wing party, voted against the act, um, considering it too, uh, at going, as going too far. But also the Green Party voted against the act as um, perceiving the opposite, namely that the act would not go as far enough. And then very recently, uh, this June, um, the population voted against a new version, like uh, another revision, so to speak, like a version after the one that failed in 2017. Um, a very rather ambitious uh, draft with a flight, uh, um, a levy on flight tickets, for example, but it failed again. Um, but this time um, by the popula popular vote, and also a reason was this time a little similar again, like in the parliament, a very good campaign led by the Switzerland's People Party that eventually led the um, act to fail. But the story is not um, um, ending here. So Switzerland can also be seen as a pioneer, namely in its adaptation policy. It has a federal ad adaptation strategy. All the cantons have adaptation strategies. There are several pilot programs in, ver um, um, in various sectors, such as for water resources, forestry, agriculture, preventing ha natural hazards or tourism. Um, there are right now, um, there have been 30 projects like this um, until 2017. There are 50 further projects running right now um, at the national level, the cantonal level, but also uh, on the local level. Um, and if you look uh, at climate policy in Switzerland in a federal context, you can see that um, mitigation, which is here on the left-hand side of the slide, is really more a federal thing. So we have the federal CO2 Act, and uh, adaptation, on the other hand, is more um, 
um, implemented and formulated in a multi-level context. However, um, also in the mitigation realm, there are three things actually that needs to be mentioned here. So firstly, the building program is implemented on the cantonal level, but also um, the cantons have considerable power in the traffic and energy sector. And that is um, a few cantons, um, like 33rd of the cantons, 33% um, of the cantons have CO2 targets. And also, for example, on almost a, or more than a fourth of the municipalities have in um, are um, um, have an energy label called Energiestadt Gold. They're certificate certificated as um, energy cities that are specifically energy friendly. Um, and the cantons, I mentioned that they all have um, adaptation strategies, which are um, more or less uh, ambitious. So if you look at this slide, something that should strike you is the difference. So it's only 30% of the cantons that have targets. It's only one third, one fourth of the muni municipalities that um, have own energy policies. Um, and in this chapter, we actually trying to shed light uh, on the reasons for, for these variations. And to do so, we uh, um, leaned on two master theses that were uh, conducted at University of Bern under the supervision of Karin Ingold, who cannot be here today. Both studies are um, based on a qualitative comparative analysis. Uh, the first study is um, looking at the cantons and those cantons with an own adaptation strategy. And the other study is looking at cities uh, that are um, that have the energy label. And interestingly, both studies come to very similar conclusions. Um, before I come to the results, uh, a few words on the factors that we have checked. So we have used um, uh, the multiple stream framework for this analysis and we looked at three different streams namely the problem stream the policy stream and the politics stream and we looked at the cantonal level at factors such as the alps um, so for example how much percentage are covered of the canton with the alps the perception of the citizens on climate change as a threat um, on climate adaptation, as mentioned, as a legislative goal. Then also, if climate mitigation is supported by the canton in its own um, policies. And then on the politics level, if the head of department is from left or from a left or green party. Um, and then also we control for the size of the canton administration. On the municipal level, um, we looked on um, the factor of performance. So the energy energy efficiency, we use the energy efficiency performance index here for the city. Then also changes in the energy policy at the cantonal level as external factor here. Then uh, the um, if the energy city goal standard is defined as a legislative goal, is that if the city has its own energy supply company and again, if the head of the city is left or green. And then also in additional, if the, uh, the proportion of left and uh, green seats in the municipal parliament. And what both studies have found that it's actually three factors that determine whether a um, canton or municipality has own adaptation or mitigation endeavors, namely the problem perception. So if climate change is perceived by the citizens as a big problem, there is a greater tendency to have own adaptation strategies and mitigation um, policies. Uh, if there are already existing uh, mitigation policies and targets, this is mainly for the, for the municipalities in the cantons, and then also very important and not very surprising, when there is a left or green majority uh, in the um, city councils or uh, in the cantons. Um, this brings me already to a conclusion. Um, we have not found any evidence about diffusion and learning between the cantons. Um, those cantons and cities are so called
called Forerunners of Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation, who felt particularly under pressure, for example, by climate change impacts or by raising energy consumption. There is um, more room for interaction and effective multi-level governance between the different government levels, in particular in the context of mitigation. And um, what we identified as a research gap is the coordination among, uh, it should not say countries, but cant uh, cantons or cities. And um, with this, I say many thanks for your attention. If you have more questions, I have a few more slides in the appendix um, about climate impacts and uh, the state of research and all that. Thank you so much, Marlena. Um, really interesting to learn uh, a bit more about uh, the case. I found uh, really interesting to understand that uh, the Swiss are at once laggards and leaders. So that was quite interesting. I appreciate that. And to think that the, the cantons are applying a sectoral approach and making uh, advances there or forerunners in this area. Thank you so much for that, Marlena. Um, next, um, we're going to ask um, for Dr. Peter Eckersley to present on Germany. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know how to upload the slides here. I'll put them on the playlist, so I don't know if they can just be we can just run onto them easily or not. Or share screen, Peter. Yeah, oh, that works. This one? Sorry, that's yeah. mine. <laughs> yes, that's not mine. Um, I added another file uh, on this morning. You need to upload. You can upload to the playlist. Oh, I can. Oh, I can just share the uh, screen. Up, but I wasn't sure how to do that actually. Oh. Um. Hmm. Ah, here. It should oh, be this actually. one, right? Yes, that's the one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Thank you. Uh. Hello, everyone. Um. My name is Peter Akazi. I work at the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society in Space, which is based near, uh, in, near Berlin in Germany. And I also work at the uh, University, uh, Nottingham Trent University in the UK. So I'm 50% in, in both institutions. Um, this paper is based on, you know, obviously we were asked to, to write the chapter on, on Germany um, for, for the book. And so this is something that I've put together with my colleagues um, at the Leibniz Institute, um, Christina Kern, who many of you may be aware of, um, Wolfgang Haupt and also Hannah Müller. Um, and we kind of put this together in, in the context of a project that we're doing, which looks at climate adaptation and also to, an, to a certain extent mitigation in, in German cities. Um, so some of the focus is on cities, but also some of it is on a, the, the different approaches of the different German states, the, the lender, um, and the, the support that they provide to different cities within, within Germany as well. Um, I found Marlena's presentation really interesting in that context because obviously she looked at the, the three different levels too. Um, but uh, I'll begin by just talking a bit about the um, kind of the structures of German federalism and the history of German federalism, which I think is important to understand when, when we try to get a, grisp, uh, get a grasp of, of, of how climate policy functions and, um, within the country. Um, then I'll talk a bit about German climate policy in general, and particularly the, the Energiewende, so the energy transition, which has been um, ongoing in Germany now for, for, for the best part of two decades, really. Um, it kind of fluctuated a bit. Um, and I'll talk about the implications of federalism for, for the development of that, particularly about you know how things may have stalled a bit recently and how um, things may develop in, in the future, um, given how, how we've gone more recently. Um, because there has been... A bit of a divergence really between the different states and also within municipalities as to how seriously they take the issue and, and how ambitious their policies are. Um, and that in itself is quite interesting when we think about what the literature says about how German federalism functions and, and what perhaps its strengths are and what perhaps its weaknesses are in terms of um, developing and implementing policy. Okay. <clears throat> so just to give you an overview of, of, of uh, German federalism and how it kind of is characterized in the literature. So, I mean, Germany does have a long tradition of decentralized governance. Um, it only became a, a unified state in 1871, which by European standards was, was really quite late. Um, and its current structures are a legacy of, of what was set up after the end of World War II by the Allies. And there was a, a deliberate conscious attempt by 
by the Western Allies to ensure that the return of a, a centralized Germany in, in which power could be concentrated in the hands of a, a few individuals um, could not be repeated. And so there were kind of deliberate checks and balances put into the new con uh, constitution that was set up then to ensure that, that power was, was distributed across the country um, horizontally and also vertically. Um, and this led really to um, it becoming characterized as this classic model of cooperative federalism, whereby different institutions, different bodies had to co uh, collaborate with each other in order to get things done at the federal level. So that there wouldn't necessarily be you know, the opportunity for someone like Hitler to come along again and, and basically do whatever he wanted to do without there being a broad consensus within, within the country for, for, for um, in, in favor of those particular policies. Um, so the state institutions, the, there were 16 states, uh, the lender, and each of those um, put send representatives to the Bundesrat, which is the second parliamentary chamber within Germany. There were also systems of shared taxes, federal state working groups to kind of coordinate policy making and implementation between different levels um, of the federal system. Um, this did lead the system to be kind of criticized for because th there's high number of veto players within um, within federalism, because more people need to agree on something in order for it to be um, agreed and implemented. Um, this idea of kind of lowest common de uh, denominator decision making. So, Fritz Schaaf wrote something you know, really quite influential back in the 70s, which was then translated to English in the 80s, um, about um, where he criticized the, the, the system, firstly, because it meant that decision making was slow and bureaucratic, but also he, he said that it, it kind of it, it was. It meant that decision makers were unaccountable because nobody was really sure who was deciding on a particular policy because so many people, so many actors needed to be involved. Having said that, um, one thing when I, when I did uh, my PhD a few years ago, I compared climate policy making in German cities with with English cities, and and I kind of I saw the this this system as being um, a benefit when there is broad agreement on a policy because it ensures that um, there's better coordination of between different levels of government. Um, it ensures that the state has more power and more influence in ensuring that it, it can choose the instruments that it wants to choose, that it thinks are most effective, that it can ensure that it can deliver its agenda more effectively than in a more kind of um, disaggregated and fragmented system, um, as is the case in the UK. So. Again, kind of you know, benefits, kind of typical benefits and drawbacks, really, of of of, of federal systems. Um, and initially, also the German approach to, towards COVID nineteen was seen as as being really beneficial because um, there was this coordination between different levels, and the local level was empowered, um, particularly on local public health teams, to to uh, test, track, trace, and uh, and isolate people much better than it was in in countries like the UK, for example. Um, more recently, there's been a bit more pushback from from the states um, to say, well, actually, you know, we, we we should be more in control of the restrictions that are in place within within our jurisdictions, and and so you know, we can see why there's consensus. It's perhaps a, a good thing when there's not consensus. It means that decision making gets held up. Um, so I suppose we were interested to see whether there is still broad agreement on climate and energy, and energy policy because there was in the early days of the energy transition, um, or are we seeing divergence amongst the states? that may be holding back um, federal policy ambition. I suppose that's kind of the theoretical um, research question that, that we asked ourselves in the context of this, this edited book. So Germany is a you know, highly industrialized country with a large manufacturing sector, and it does have a high level of G, uh, per capita GHG emissions, so higher on average than the average uh, in, in the European Union, not as high as Australia. And, and, and the US, but still, um, given this industrial legacy, it's perhaps not surprising that it's it's higher than, than many other countries. Despite this, it is still quite often portrayed, or has been in the past, as a, a forerunner or pioneer compared to other OECD countries because of because of things like the the um, energy transition, which um, was introduced initially in the the early two thousands by a, a social democrat and green coalition federal government. Um, it was then kind of put on hiatus, uh, but after the um, Fukushima disaster, the federal government, which then was a conservative liberal coalition, actually thought, you know, we, we need to transition away from, from nuclear power after all. The focus there initially was moving away from nuclear power, but also there was an understanding that there was a need to move away from fossil fuels as well towards renewable sources. Um, 
Germany also met all of its Kyoto Protocol targets, the only country apart from the UK to do so. Um, and it set it did set then ambitious targets in the future to to continue on that trajectory. Um, but a lot of the initial progress that it made was was due to the closing down of industrial plants in in the old East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, which meant that a lot of the high polluting industries no longer were in operation after the mid 1990s, and that led to a massive initial drop in in Germany's GHG emissions, which hasn't there hasn't really continued on on that on that trend since then. And actually, opposition to to um, climate mitigation has grown a little bit in recent years. There is still a broad consensus in Germany that that it's a, a major issue and, and and something needs to be done about it. It's not the same as it is in Australia and the US, for example. But but things like rising energy prices due to the energy transition. Um, Perhaps that's not quite as, as big an issue as it was a few years ago because obviously the, the price of renewable uh, energy has, has fallen a bit recently. But that if, certainly I remember five or six years ago, that, that was a, a big source of opposition uh, amongst the, the left party, for example. Um, other things like the, uh, um, the installation of wind turbines and electricity transmission networks, which would, the idea is that they would um, transmit renewable energy from, from the windy north down to parts of Germany which have fewer renewable resources, and, but there was a lot of opposition to the installation of these uh, of these networks. Um, and also, fossil-based industries still employ a lot of people in what are otherwise deprived areas, particularly in the former East. Um, and there are other kind of locked-in um, industry interests, particularly around uh, the car industry, um, which make it difficult for Germany to do things like introduce a speed limit on the motorway or introduce tougher restrictions on um, uh, on the standards that, that are introduced in, in, in motor vehicles. Um, so, as I say, how does this kind of cooperative federalism affect its climate approach? Well, we looked at all 16 of the of the states and we, we, we looked at the documentation, the legislation that the state governments have produced over the last 20 years, essentially, and um, or even 30 years in some cases. And also we interviewed people in six of the different states as well to get a feeling on um, on, on what they were doing, essentially. And we grouped the states into, into these five different categories. So we, we at the top there, we have the coal states. Those are still highly dependent on fossil fuels, particularly on, on the coal industry, um, whether that's um, kind of traditional hard black coal in most parts of the West or in most parts of the East, the brown coal lignite, which, um, which Alan mentioned is obviously a an issue still in Australia. Um, so they still have high CO2 emissions. They still ex they export a lot of their energy. In some cases, particularly in the East, they do have re uh, growing renewable sectors, but they're not obviously as, uh, they don't see this as being quite a, as important an issue as perhaps, or as, as easy an issue to deal with as other parts of Germany. So in the South, for example, uh, Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, um, traditionally very dependent on nuclear power, um, and they found it a bit easier to transition away from that than the coal states have away from fossil fuels because they have more sun. And they also have wealthier, to be fair, they have wealthier residents as well, many of whom have installed solar panels on the roofs of their houses or they've um, big massive solar farms in many agricultural areas as well. So those, t those two states in particular um, account for a significant proportion of Germany's solar energy. In the north, along the North Sea coast and the Baltic coast, um, we have another three states that are, are also previously were quite dependent on nuclear power and now have transitioned quite successfully towards wind energy because it's much windier there, whether that's onshore or offshore. Um, they have installed a massive number of, of, of wind farms. Kind of in the middle towards the south, we have another three states which are more dependent on energy imports. They have neither the fossil fuel resources nor the uh, kind of the renewable resources of, of many other states. So there is a growing renewable sector in some parts, but but actually they're highly dependent on energy imports. And you could say actually that they have less control over their, their energy and their climate policies than the other parts of Germany do. Um, and then we have three city states. So um, three of the biggest cities in Germany, Berlin, Hamburg and Bremen. Um, because of their geography, there's not really a great deal of potential there for, to install wind farms in, in urban areas, for example. Um, uh, but because of the high population density, they have a really quite low CO2 per capita, in kind of four or five tons per, uh, per year per capita, which is significantly lower than the average. Um, but they still, in many cases, 
have uh, fossil fuel coal burning power stations within their territories because that uh, the legacy of, of, of many years is, is still there. So this shows where they are on, on the maps, um, on, on the map of Germany. You can see how geographically kind of concentrated the different groups are. And also on the table there on the left, we can see how the coal states, even though they've made significant reductions in GHG emissions per capita since 1990, particularly in um, in the three uh, in the former East there, Saxony, Saxony, Anhalt and Brandenburg, um, they're still producing significant um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, by contrast, those further in the south um, are in uh, yeah, Bavarian Bad Wurnberg, um, <clears throat> GHG emissions are, are significantly smaller, and also in, in most um, of other parts of Germany too, even though they haven't made quite sig such significant reductions perhaps in the last 20 years. You have about two minutes left just to okay. Uh, yeah. Fine. Um, one other thing that we looked at, um, there was legislation that are passed by these states. And what we found was really interesting was that, um, well, firstly, North rhine Westphalia is the only coal state that's passed a Climate Change Act, act that commits the state to a certain uh, percentage re reduction in GHG emissions. Um, the other parts of Germany have all done this um, and increasingly ambitious as well. Those that have been passed more recently have set more ambitious targets. Um, what we also thought was interesting, apart from the two at the bottom there, Bavaria and Lower Saxony, in each case, these these acts were passed by state governments that included the Green Party in the coalition. Um, and by contrast, the other five states that hadn't passed an act, um, in every case, the Green Party in the state parliament tried to introduce one, but it was vetoed by the ruling coalition. So we can see how there's definitely a um kind of party political aspect associated with many of these policies even though the the left-wing social uh, kind of center-left social democrats often um, get into coalition with the green party when they're not in coalition with the green party they still have many ties particularly with the, the car industry and the coal industry in the west which perhaps makes them more reluctant to uh, engage in more ambitious policy we've also seen divergence at the municipal level as well where um there's a lot of studies that show that larger and wealthier cities are more likely to be uh, to have developed ambitious climate policies um, because smaller and generally less wealthy ones tend to have fewer resources and perhaps see this as um, less of a priority. But kind of related to that, where the state government or the federal government has provided funding to these municipalities, in many cases they have developed this, you know, this ambitious, more ambitious policy. Um, and certainly Christina Kern had a article published in Environmental Politics um, a couple of years ago that showed how this, this kind of upscaling can be effective in um, in improving climate um, climate ambition and climate policy at the municipal level where, where the funding is provided. But crucially, climate policy um, is kind of it's still a non-mandatory function in nearly everywhere in Germany. And so councils only get involved with it, cities only get involved with it if they feel, if they feel that they should do or that they want to. Um, in Baden-Württemberg, this is slightly different because the Climate Act that they passed there enabled the state government to require municipalities to produce local heat plans, which is the only place in Germany and um, one of the few parts of the OECD where that's now required. Um, and that's well, just kind of wrapping up. You know, studies of urban climate governors tend to focus on the big successful cities. They focus on Copenhagen or Barcelona. Or, um, in Germany, it might be Münster or Freiburg. Um, but actually, there's lots of places that we don't really know very much about what they're doing, um, and this was part of the um, part of the push to get our project off the ground in the first place. And and that, all we've really found so far is that yeah, some places are doing something, but there's still loads of other places that we don't know that much about. To bring it back to the the theory of German federalism, that there is definitely increasing divergence amongst the states and also amongst municipalities and climate and energy policy, um, and the the different <laughs> strategies that the states and the municipalities adopt tend to reflect the state economic interests in the politics um, and there's quite a big literature around kind of the different political actors and different departments within the federal government almost kind of being being captured by by powerful lobby groups whether that's the car industry or whether that's the fossil fuel industry that has then perhaps made the federal government less reluctant to, to push things forward um, having said that there was a federal climate act in 2019 which introduced these targets, but then 
More, uh, only a couple of months ago, there was a, a court ruling that said that actually the federal government's not doing enough to meet these targets and they need to be much more ambitious in order to um, deliver on the, the, the Paris uh, climate goals. Um, so I suppose we, we kind of concluding you know, with, with a question really that the energy vendor, you know, the energy transition may be slowing down because of because of these different interests um, within the different levels of government. Um, and so the system of cooperative federalism may becoming more may be becoming more problematic for taking climate policy to the next level. Um, we have a federal election in September, um, in which the Green Party, I think, are almost certain to form the to be in the coalition government afterwards for the first time since twenty two thousand seven. So it might be interesting to see if there's a change in 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 approach after that. I expect there probably would be. Um, but having said that, Germany still um, at the moment it's not. On, not on target to meet its objectives. Um, and we can almost kind of see that Germany is a microcosm of global climate governance because there is this overarching framework within which it's operating at the federal level, but then lots of different interests at subnational level, um, whether that's some of the city states, for example, are far more concerned with adaptation than they are with mitigation because their per capita emissions are already quite low and they feel quite vulnerable to flash flooding and, and, and heat impacts um, because of their geography, um, whereas at the other the other side of the fence on, on mitigation, there are some parts of Germany that are still quite wedded to fossil fuels um, that are more reluctant to take things forward than other parts of Germany where the transition's been, uh, you know, taking much rapid, more rapid progress. Okay, I think that's me. Thanks. I wasn't too, that's, too much. That's time. it. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. A really uh, interesting to learn a bit about the um, advantage of federalism, but now it's potentially turning into the corporatist system turning as a disadvantage and what you call about the lowest common denominator about decision-making um, may be influencing uh, policy there. So that, that was really interesting. Thank you. And, and the, the, the combination of influences around politics, uh, regional matters, as well as um, fiscal resources. So really interesting stuff. Thank you. Um, next um, on the agenda, we have the presentation on China from um, Professor Araz Tahay and um, Dr. Lily Li. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm going to present the uh, research myself and then Professor Araz will be there. Um, yeah, how to open... Okay, can you see the slide? Um, if, if my camera blocks the slide, you can move it to the side. Um, so uh, today I'm going to present our paper on understanding China's environmental governance, an investigation of the central local government interactions in policy implementation. Although China is not a traditional federalism country, but its provincial and municipal municipal governments have a lot of freedom or discretion to implement policy measures. China at national level, it has now has a green national policy agenda with diverse policy measures to deal with environmental and climate issues. In addition to its traditional command and control policy measures, now China has adopted many types of policy instruments uh, for instance, it has like imposed charge on emissions, it created emission trading market, it also has informational measures like organized uh, public information campaigns. But there is a gap between what the national government wants to do and the local implementation effectiveness. A few studies have examined China's central local government relations in environmental policy implementation and then show that the central government tried to foster local policy implementation through communication, incentives and control. But they also show that simply increased central control cannot foster policy implementation in every case. Although there are studies, there are already studies on central local government in relations in China, but a study that examined China's central local government interactions when implementing different types of environmental policy instruments is yet to be taken. 
So that's why this research, we aim to investigate the vertical central local government interactions when implementing different types of environmental policy instruments and also to unfold the barriers to effective policy implementation. We take a case study approach and selected cases of three different policy instruments. Using the typology of uh, Salomon, who classified policy instruments based on cri four criteria, uh, cohesion, directness, automaticity, and visibility. One policy instrument is the pollutant discharge fee, which impose charge on emissions. It has a medium level cohesion and directness, but a high level automaticity at it used like economic incentive and it also has a high visibility. The environmental target system where the central government will give mandatory environmental targets to local governments, is it has a high level cohesion, directness and visibility, but a low level automaticity as it rely on the traditional and command and control approach. The carbon dioxide emission scheme uh, you all mentioned before is had it's a market based policy instrument and it relies on low level uh, it has a low level cohesion directness and visibility but a high level automaticity as it rely on a market mechanism. So to analyze this for a three policy instruments, the first is a pollutant discharge fee which um, impose charge on each unit of emissions into the environment. The government actually has started to use it in 1982 in a few policy pilots. And over time, gradually the government expanded the policy scope and now it apply uh, and then eventually applied the policy measure to all major pollutants and also apply it nationally. The central government would give a reference charging rate. Accordingly, local governments can revise the charging rate according to their local context. So, in addition to make decisions on the charging rate, local governments actually also have discretion over assessing the categories and the quantities of emissions and make final decisions on whether a Worm should pay for should pay the pollutant discharge fee and the, how much this firm should pay. But as a but there is an implementation barrier where like local governments may protect local firms who generated like high tax by waiving their pollutant discharge fee. There are also in some cases local environmental protection bureaus would use the collected money for things not relating to the environment. For, for, for example, they would pay the salaries, use the money or pay medical expenses. So to respond to those implementation issues, the central government actually uh, took some measures. For instance, it uh, meant more detailed procedure measures to for the collection and use of a, pollutant discharge fee. And it also asked local environmental protection bureaus to submit the money to the financial departments rather than spend the money themselves. Uh, environmental target system translated from Chinese Mu Biao Zi Renji. It works in the way that the central government would allocate environmental targets to, look to provincial governments, but also leave room for negotiation. And then local uh, provincial governments have to sign contracts, sorry, there's type, have to sign contracts to commit to the environmental targets. If they can achieve the environmental targets, then can be rewarded through like job promotion or monetary rewards. But if they fail to reach those environmental targets, then also face punishments like salary costs or getting fired. The policy measure was initially applied in some regions in China in 2002, but since 2007, the central government decided to use the policy measure in the whole country. 
So the local governments, as mentioned, can negotiate it with the central government to change their environmental targets, or then can make decisions on how to distribute the environmental targets to their lower level governments or to firms. Uh, the, the local governments also has uh, have discretion power over choosing specific environmental measures or technologies at local level. But um, there is an implementation issue regarding the conflict between environmental and economic targets. Local government also have to meet economic targets that were allocated that are allocated by the central government. So facing all these pressures to reaching all the targets, in some cases, local governments would fix their environmental achievements. And because of the information asymmetry, the central government may have limited capacity to tell who are lying. And in some cases, in other cases, local governments would almost overemphasize the short-term accountability by taking extreme measures such as cutting off their electricity to reduce emissions. Central government uh, were aware of that um, and established six regional environmental supervision uh, bureaus to enhance control and supervision over local governments. Um, next. So post, a Chinese government like to use policy experimentation to accelerate policy and institutional change. Uh, Hellman described Chinese style policy experimentation as experimentation under the hierarchy. It means uh, in the way that um, the city government or municipal governments men, like establish and operate policy pilots. And over time, those policy pilots can build up the political sports with the possibility to be output scaled to the national level. And then central government, uh, during all the uh, policy experimentation time, it will maintain the leadership and interventions and man integrate local knowledge into central policy making. Emission trading scheme creates a market for emission allowance and it gives the signal that polluters have to pay for their emissions. Um, since 2013, the Chinese government has um, started to build policy pilots of emission trading schemes to reduce CO2 emissions. And since 2017, uh, the central government decided to upscale the policy experimentation to build a national emission trading scheme. Uh, in the policy pilot of the emission trading scheme, then were given the local government were given actually a lot of the discretion power over their specific policy design and policy implementation. But there are also implementation issues. For instance, they were criticized for lax enforcement. Some policy pilots like Chongqing um, were criticized for giving firms too many emission allowance and which gave firms very little incentive to reduce their emissions. And data monitoring, reporting, and verification was another issue. Local governments make rules for that, but usually the MRV rules were ambiguous and not strictly enforced. The central government did not intervene a lot in this case compared to what it did in the other two, but it organize some workshops with the policy pilots for them to share their experience to promote policy learning. It also has announced these uh, measures for the administration of carbon emission trading to provide some guidelines for the local policy implementation. So to sum up, all three policy measures face some kinds of implementation barriers at the local level. The pollutant discharge fee face issues like misappropriation of collected fees and local protectionism. Environmental target system uh, facing issues like faking environmental achievements and overemphasis on short-term accountability. 
the emission treating scheme policy pilot basically issues like lax enforcement and ambiguous data monitoring reporting and the verification rules. Um, a fundamental issue behind these um, implementation issues is that it's the information asymmetry between the central and local governments. The central government actually were trying to enhance the central control through building the six regional environmental supervision bureaus. But it's, it's very costly for them to constantly check and verify local environmental performance. In addition, the central government also take, have, take, has taken measures to enhance environmental information disclosure and public participation. Uh, for instance, a hotline has been established for citizens to report uh, their local environmental issues and ICT technologies have been applied to enhance information disclosure. Another fundamental problem we think is the trade-off between the local economic growth and environmental sustainability. So I guess the policy implication is that more central control, even in China, is very costly and not a panacea for every environmental policy implementation case. And more efforts can be done to enhance the environmental information disclosure and public participation to, to foster the environmental policy implementation. For local governments, um, emission intensive, they have to realize that emission intensive industries are not sustainable and they need to find the potential possibility to transit away from uh, emission intensive industries to green and low carbon industries to solve the conflict between the uh, economic growth and the sustainability. So, nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lily. Um, really, really fascinating and very interesting to learn a little bit about um, what's what's happening, what the situation is in China, particularly um, the centrality of uh, local government in policy implementation. And what um, I gathered is potentially an hourglass model of uh, implementation of policies with the uh, regional governments playing more of an administrative uh, role. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, Lily. Um, next, we move to the discussion on California and Quebec, um, which um, Charles Berthelay will now present. Thank you, Charles. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Loud, loud and clear, yeah. Okay, super. Um, unfortunately, I will have to uh, keep my camera closed because uh, otherwise I uh, will uh, probably experience some um, connection issues. So I will I think it's there. Okay. Sorry, I would find my PowerPoint. So can you see my PowerPoint? Not, not yet. No, okay. Um, sorry. Okay, I will I will start and try to share it. Um, oh, okay, I think that it will do. Can you there tell me? Go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And just okay. Well, here we go. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this panel for giving me the chance to be among you today. So, as mentioned in the title of the presentation, the broader research question I am interested in answering is the following. Under what circumstances are social identities and, more specifically, societal myths enablers or disablers of climate action? 
both domestically and internationally, and particularly in federal context. This being said, today's presentation will focus more narrowly on the framing effects of societal identities on the climate discourse of federal, federated states. There will, there will be four parts to my presentation. First, I will present my conceptual framework, followed by a short description of my methodology. In the third part, I will present one of my case studies, California, in order to exemplify or illustrate my broader theoretical argument. In the fourth and final part, I will conclude with a few remarks and insights that can be drawn from the comparison of California and Quebec, if I have the time to do so. So what follows here is but a superficial and partial definition of what I refer to as societal identities. My theoretical starting point is that collective identities are socially and, of course, discursive, constructed and relation relationally constituted. This can be done instrumentally, for instance, by political or identity entrepreneurs, but it uh, can also occur through the normal course of our social interactions and interrelations, both between and within societies. Societal identities as part of culture more ger generally can be the vehicle as well as the product of intersubjective meanings and understandings that are, although imperfectly, replicated in the minds of the majority of a given society's ind individual members. Those meanings are conveyed by myths and narratives that form the collective, the collective or societal identity. They then become a cognitive feature of one own personally, personality or personal identity and can notably act as cognitive or heuristic bias. A collective identity provides a society with an intersubjective self-image and a collective sense of self. It contains some in the identity criteria or features that help to identify the appropriate or legitimate members of the society and their own identification to the society. Therefore, the foundation of any societal identity is always at least one significant other whose identity can change throughout the course, throughout the course of history. In other words, the constitutive or distinctive features of collective identities act both as factors of differentiation and individuation, which set the society apart from other communities, and as factors of integration and unification of individual members that operate for, from within. I also work with the concept of midscape, which was developed by David Bell. According to Bell, every society is dependent on a yet constituted and well-established set of myths to which political and identity entrepreneurs will constantly refer in order to mobilize their symbolic power for their own ends. They will also use existing myths to construct new operating myths by connecting new ideas and meanings to what is already available in the mythscape. A mythscape is therefore a symbolic field in which political struggles occur. Quebec sociologist Gérard Bouchard distinguishes between two types of myths. First, they are master myths, which are at the foundation of the mythscape and are deeply rooted in history. Second, Second, they, they are derivative myths, which by definition are more concrete, contem contemporary adaptations of master myths. Because they are adaptative, derivative myths allow master myths to endure through time. Collective identities are not unique to nation states. That's an important point I want to make. Federated states can also support a collective identity of the type described 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 above, I'm sorry, they could be referred to regional identity, like identities like the ones displayed by the state of California and the Canadian province of Alberta, or minority national identities in cases where minority nations are, are involved, like Quebec or Catalonia. I strong, strongly prefer the term societal identity, however, because it is better suited to federal context. In federations, there is a division of sovereignty, a decentralization of powers, and an overlap between different spheres of constitutional competence and authority. 
In a very similar ma manner, societal identities in federal states are divided and overlapping. People identify with their substates as well as their nation states. The collective identities that have formed at each level are autonomous from one another, but they are also connected on multiple levels and operate in relations to one another. Federations are an environment in which the simultaneous construction of a shared and of an autonomous identity for each constitu constitutive part of the federal regime can occur. The interpretive framework I will now present allows, allows me to determine whether societal myths are indeed present and whether they play a role in the environmental discourse and the discursive framing of climate action by political leaders in federated states. It is a necessary, necessary first step before any further research, research can be. I'm sorry. It is a necessary f first step before any further research can be conducted on this topic. In my view, my approach is injective and focuses on the the official environmental discourse of two federated states, California and Quebec. More specifically, I examine the I examine examine the official speeches of public statement. I'm sorry. No, so, most specifically, I examine the, the official speeches and public statements of the Californian and Quebec heads of state over a different period of time. I have so limited my exploratory research to the international discourse of each state, that is, the discourse of the green para diplomacy, since foreign policy, whether it is deployed at the national or sub state level, was recognized in the theoretical literature as a major tool of identity building. Moreover, the period I selected from, for each case corresponds to an episode of exceptional international activism in the domain of climate change on the part of each sub-state government. For California, I look at the period during which Jerry Brown and Donald Trump were simultaneously, simultaneously I'm sorry, in power in Sacramento and Washington that is from 2016 to 2018. For Quebec, I examined the 2006-2012 period during which Stephen Harper was in power in Ottawa and Joshua acted as Quebec's premier. Both cases are exceptional instances, and as such, they can only serve to draw preliminary observations, not causal generalizations. My method of discourse analysis, analysis involves three main steps. First, I try to reconstitute the potential identity discourse of California and Quebec pertaining to climate change by looking at public declarations and official speeches made by Jerry Brown and Josh Array in an international setting dur during the selected periods of, an, of investigation. The data has been collected from a rather exhaustive press review, including articles from major American, Californian, Canadian, or Quebec dailies. The goal is to, of this first step is to see if and how a collective self or subject, California or Quebec, emerges from the international discourse on climate change of the feder federated state, and whether this self is specifically associated to environmental features. In other words, I seek to determine, to de to determine if Jerry Brown and Josh Are attribute some kind of green identity or personality to their federated state. Additionally, since identity is intrinsically relational and comparative, I strive to identify at least one significant other in relation to which this identity discourse is articulated. The second step involves identify, uh, identifying the context of which the collective identity is articulated. To simplify, the goal is to map the midscape of the federal, the federal state in which the federated state is embedded, as well as the federated states own symbolic landscape. For this part, I rely on secondary sources in, in history and sociology. Finally, I did my own interpretive analysis of the elements of identity discourse found in step one, in light of the elements of interpretive context found in step two. In other words, I reread the green para diplomacy discourse of California and Quebec in their social and historical context, thus producing an intertext. The entire method of discourse analysis I employed can be summed up as follows. I identified a text, mapped its context, 
and interpret the de-enter text. Unfortunately, I will not have the time to present both my cases today, so I will present parts of my results on California as an illustration of my central argument. So let's just say for the moment that I found two master myths for uh, America. Uh, the first one is American ex exceptionalism. Uh, and in American foreign policy, three versions of this exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism have been uh, mainly presented. Isolationism, neoconservative unilateralism, sorry, and multilateral liberalism, all of which present America as a world leader. And it is worth noting that the Republic of California has developed its own version of American exceptionalism. That is, Californian exceptionalism derived itself from the wide rest Wild West derivative myth and representing California as the perfect incarnation of American exceptionalism in its most liberal and progressive interpretation. San Francisco and the Silicon Valley being, for instance, recurring symbols of liberal values and technological progress. Governor Gavin Newsom's Twitter account speaks for itself. And the, the second master myth of the American society is the discourse on societal polarization and political division, which has endured over the course of American history, and which manifests itself in its most recent form as the discourse on the so-called American cultural politics. And the fact is, this discourse on culture wars is exactly the discourse on which uh, Donald Trump chose to embed is the climate discourse. So that's, that's the point I want to make. Uh, I'm, I'm going a little bit faster on this point, but the discourse to which the Californian paradigm, green power diplomacy would respond is, in my view, embed, embedded in the discourse on the cultural wars. And it is a version, the Trump's version of American exceptionalism, to which Hillary Clinton has responded in his campaign in 2016 uh, by presenting his plan for, uh, to make America a superpower, a climate superpower. So, and this is where California's green power diplomacy and identity come in. First of all, Governor Brown's international discourse on climate change presented California as a champion of climate change mitigation, as if the values and principles offered by the Californian people and constitutive of their regional identity naturally led to climate action. In Brown's opinion, California has to be a climate leader, not only in America, but across the world, supporting cities, other federated states, and sovereign states alike in their struggle and mitigation efforts against climate change. In broad of its own state, California is therefore an exception itself, but, is, but it is also a clear territorial instanti instantiation of the liberal and pro-climate action stance adopted by the Democrats against the, new, the conservative camp in the context of the so-called American culture wars. Therefore, on, one, on the one hand, Brown constructs a united green California, green identity for California, obscuring political division and disagreement within his own state. And on the other, he openly contests the unity of American identity by refusing to let Donald Trump speak on behalf of the United States as a whole when he denies climate change and refuses to take action. It is worthy to note that the main significant order in relation to which Jerry Brown develops California's identity in the context of his Green Parade diplomacy discourse is Donald Trump's federal administration. Under Trump, the federal government is depicted as an unworthy representative of America's identity abroad. And I will finish on this. So overall, Jerry Brown's family discourse does not merely present another voice from America, but another voice of America, or Put differently, the voice of another America. It invokes another version of the American exceptionalism myth, 
around which it attempts to create a united American identity that is receptive to climate action. In conclusion, the survey of California's identity discourse pertaining to climate change shows that societal myths and identities are effectively mobilized towards instrumental ends by political actors at both the federal and federated level. Furthermore, the same foundational myths can have diametrically opposed framing effects. In the examples discussed above, we see that American exceptionalism can be interpreted in two ways, one that leads towards climate change denialism and inaction, and one that is potentially conducive to climate leadership and policy making. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Charles, for uh, your presentation. And I must say, I found this, uh, for me uh, anyway, a new dimension to think about what may, may in fact be a, a large influence on climate um, policy, climate change policy. So thank you so much, Charles. Um, we are now moving into the discussant uh, portion of uh, our panel today, and uh, we'll ask um, George Stairs to please um, present uh, his, his uh, thoughts uh, in the role of discussant. Thank you, George. All right, uh, can you all hear me all right? Okay, so uh, I know we're uh, kind of uh, pressed for time, so I'll try and uh, cut down my reviews of the uh, various papers and presentations. Uh, I'll go in the order that they were uh, presented and uh, I'll try and ask uh, some probing questions for each of you. And uh, so we'll go through the five papers and then we can open it up for uh, wider discussion after the fact. So I will ask a question, but uh, try to keep in mind how much uh, time we have when you're uh, replying to this. So for Dr. Fenna, uh, on your paper on Australia, I Thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, provided an illuminating walk through uh, a lot of Australia's recent history with this issue. Uh, you repeatedly explored the dynamics of climate change and environmentally, environmental policy becoming deeply partisan issues, uh, something which, of course, uh, I as a Canadian uh, am very familiar with. And of course, we also see that in the United States and other countries. Um, what I did want to drill down into, though, was out of this, you highlighted the horizontal intergovernmentalism that arose when Labour held office in every state and territory in Australia for a stretch of time. Um, so I guess what was interesting to me about that was uh, for those looking to address climate change, is this really what we need to hope for, is that the fortunes of electoral politics will afford us the governments that will seek to do something for this? Or is there something, uh, a role for civil society or advocacy organizations in these various countries, uh, in federal countries that can bring about uh, greater change in the more recalcitrant regions or uh, parties, so to speak. So I guess it was something where in, in all of the papers, we were very focused on political actors and uh, the policy process and what have you, but I wanted to explore whether or not there was some, th some role for civil society to explore these sorts of things. So I don't know if you wanted to briefly speak to that and then we can get to the other papers. Uh, go ahead with your other ones, George, and I'll just think about that last question. Oh, okay. Uh, we can do that as well. Has he disappeared? He's gone. I scared him off. I, I, I think you should have answered the question. Um, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think uh, maybe yeah, he's, back. he's back. He's back. I, uh, I sincerely apologize for that. I should no know. Worries, man. No worries. Yeah, the, uh, the platform's just a little uh, finicky. A little wonky. Please continue, mate. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Kemmerer, um, I appreciated the deafness uh, with which you set out. Uh, one of the more highly decentralized and highly complex systems of uh, Switzerland, and the myriad ways in which the 26 cantons are adapting to climate change. Um, of note in your paper, uh, your statistical analysis tables were quite detailed and had a lot of insight. Um, however, I did find interesting your finding in the paper that as opposed to uh, policy issues such as public health or education, you had uh, not found evidence of the 
different diffusion mechanisms and competition in the cantons um, about climate change adaptation and mitigation. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on why you think this is so. Um, and uh, you highlighted as well, you highlighted some of the existing institutions such as the Conference of Cantonal Energy Directors that might be of use for uh, addressing that uh, coordination issue, but whether or not they were being used to their full extent or capacity might be uh, another question that uh, you could uh, possibly explore. So uh, did you want me to just launch into the other uh, three and we'll uh, get into the questions after? Okay. I think so, so George, that'd be great. If you just perhaps um, list out all the, all the points that you have and then we can take them all in, in one block. As okay, we well, and they'll feed into each other. Okay, all exactly. right. I just don't like uh, talking for this long, but no, anyway, it's, so, it's really so uh, for the German paper, Dr. Eckersley, uh, you it was a lovely overview of uh, German history and the regional differences. I particularly liked how you laid out the various energy and regional types, and of course, what their motivations or lack thereof for addressing the issue of uh, climate change. You also highlighted in your paper uh, the role of green parties, uh, which in Germany have been around longer than many other green parties internationally. Um, and uh, so that was of note. And you also highlighted the role of Germany's membership and somewhat of a leadership role that it has played in the European Union as well in addressing the issue of climate change. Um, the asymmetry of the issue. Uh, um, as well, with uh, the exception of a number of uh, countries, but on this panel, certainly, uh, Germany is perhaps one of the younger federations that we're looking at right now. So initially, my question was going to be, does this afford Germany a better ability to adapt to the modern issue of climate change? But then at the end of your uh, presentation, you highlighted that what was an advantage may now be turning into uh, more of a disadvantage in certain respects. So. But I was wondering if its more recent uh, formulation of its constitution through the basic law afforded it greater uh, foresight in addressing environmental issues as opposed to older federations. Uh, now for uh, Dr. Teha and uh, Dr. Li, um, the deep dive, the exploration of the three different policy instruments and the use of federated units as the laboratories of policy, uh, I think this was very interesting uh, to read each of the analyses about the uh, different policy instruments. The depth of research into primary source materials as well that you did was uh, very illuminating. In many ways, you highlighted the very ideal of federal systems in experimenting and finding best practices and seeking to upscale that to the national level. However, you identified a number of the problems with uh, verification as well as local actors, personal ambitions and interests leading to uh, a fudging of the numbers in certain instances, as you noted. Um, so again, you uh, spoke a little bit about this, but my question for your presentation was again related to are there institutions or in place that could uh, be improved or could be expanded to address those issues in particular? For example, you highlighted the regional environmental supervision bureaus, but uh, have those had the intended results in the ensuing uh, time period since the policies were implemented? Um, yes, and also Phil highlighted the hourglass model, so I thought that would be interesting to uh, explore as well. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Dr. Berthele, uh, uh, your paper on California was uh, meticulously resourced and uh, an excellent resource uh, for anybody who would like to explore the ideas that you've raised about paradiplomacy, national societal identity, and uh, California's uh, climate change actions on the world stage. Um, I was interested, however, although your reminder about your second case study, the uh, Quebec model between uh, Charest and uh, Harper uh, allayed some of my concerns about, uh, again, any time that we discuss uh, uh, President Trump, uh, whether that was uh, too much of the focus. However, I guess the other question I would have now is uh, if the inverse is possible, where you would have a, uh, for example, a resource extraction state, likewise with a uh, 
very strong societal identity. I'm thinking of uh, states such as uh, Texas or something like that, in opposition to a national government that is seeking to do more on climate change and uh, what that might look like and how that might be dealt with by the uh, federal government. So, so anyways, uh, I apologize for rushing through those. Uh, I had to cut down a number of notes, but uh, anyways, we can open it up to uh, <clears throat> replies now, I guess. Thank you. Thanks so much, George. That was really um, wonderfully done. Thank you. Um, perhaps we just uh, proceed in the order um, that George has presented to, to the presenters. Thank you. So we begin with Alan, please. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Phil. Thanks, George. Uh, two points you raised, and I'll respond briefly to both of those. Horizontal intergovernmentalism in Australia was briefly important in the period you note. Uh, but it occurred under extremely unusual, in fact, unique circumstances. Uh, it's, it certainly played an important role in building momentum and contributing to uh, a very active period of national policy making once government uh, transferred to Labor after 2007 nationally. Uh, however, the fact is we, we can't expect, particularly in an area like this, which would have required unanimity, such unanimity to um, occur again in the foreseeable future. So I think we have to sort of rule out horizontal intergovernmentalism as something that one can either expect or depend on in any, in any sort of a way. And, and this is the argument of my paper, there are other there are alternative means to achieve many of those goals that can be done in the absence of that degree of consensus. So, so one can easily exaggerate the need for that kind of horizontal, that coordination and horizontal intergovernmentalism. The second one about the opportunities for groups in civil societies to have impact on policy. I think that's, it's not an either or in the sense that most of these groups work on and through political parties anyway, uh, and the more venues there are for them to be in which they can be active, uh, uh, that is the, through the different levels of government, the more opportunities they have. It is also the case that Australia's political system provides not only opportunity for uh, federal uh, multiplication of, uh, of um, venues for activism, but also it provides opportunities for a range of political parties through um, forms of or degrees of proportional representation in upper houses. So green parties are important as well. So there's, there's, I would say that there are plenty of avenues in and on political parties for civil society to act. And I would say that they probably had a pretty big influence. Those sort of groups had a pretty big influence on policy making in a number of the states. Thanks very much, um, Professor uh, Alan Fenner. Um, over to Marlena, please. I'll actually answer the question because we divided the work as such. So, and since it's about federalism, I'll jump in with the great pleasure. Thanks everybody for the presentation. It was fascinating, especially to hear that the German case being so similar in outcome, although we actually have one key difference that was not mentioned, which is the fiscal autonomy of both lower levels, both the municipalities and, and the cantonal governments. But it seems that it doesn't really play a role if the outcome is very similar. Now you asked George, thanks for the question, but what's so different about climate change? I think two main factors really are to be kept in mind when we compare with the other policy areas. First, it's cross-cutting. It's a cross-cutting policy area, both thematically and territorially. So you have the three levels of government all have some powers in one of the policy areas, the classic policy areas that are touched upon by climate change. And secondly, it's a relatively new policy area that uh, unlike education, the conference, so the key players for the, for the learning the horizontal learning that they're absent in Australia because you don't really need to learn from each other. You're so uh, autark as, as uh, the constituent units in Switzerland and the cantons need to learn. So they did develop those instruments, but somehow climate, climate policy, climate change policy is a late comer and is a victim of the fact that the field is already so crowded. Uh, so you have a conference of all the 26 ministers for landscape. You have a separate conference for transportation, separate one for energy, for the economy, for the environment, for the agriculture, for finance. Where does climate policy fit? In all of them, in none of them? At the moment, it's really none of them, really, uh, because on top of that, you also have the local governments 
trying to do something in housing in local transportation and in, in uh, cycling roads are the new big uh, cultural war between the left and the right right it's cars against against the pedestrians and 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 cyclists nothing to do with federalism because it's all at the local level or so you would think but then come some people and develop an initiative for a national plan for cycling and so on and so forth so it's a fragmentation both thematically and uh, th and, and territorially plus it's relatively new um, and people don't really know really where to place it in which conference or in which policy domain i wouldn't even know how to translate climate policy change into into german uh, maybe, but Marlene is more the expert on on the policy areas, and more the expert on federalism. So, hence we decided to join up for this particular project, which I think is a useful exercise. So, thanks again. Thanks so much, uh, Sean. Um, very uh, grateful for your uh, input there. Um, over to Peter, please. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question, um, George. It was about the. Uh, whether with Germany being a, a more recent federal country that enabled it to um, to set up institutions that perhaps could deal with climate change better than than in older countries, I suppose you know, like Canada, like the US, or whatever. Um, I think the answer is no. Actually, I mean, although the the institutions, the Grundgesetz states from nineteen forty eight, um, the uh, the environment was only recognised as being a public function. In 1994, and so there, it was never clear really where, uh, particularly climate change and energy policy, whereabouts they would sit uh, in terms of the legal competences for it within the federal government. And so, um, I think that, in, if anything, has actually led to the partly led to the situation that we're in now, in the different um, different tiers of government and different departments within the federal government all see it a bit as being their their, their jurisdiction. Um, I mean, we do have. In contrast to what Sean was saying about the Swiss case, um, the, one of the, the federal state associations that, that aims to coordinate policy um, between the two levels is focused on climate change. Um, but that, that wasn't embedded in the Constitution. It wasn't something that, that was set up as a result of uh, the end of the, the Second World War. So, um, so the, um, yeah, the environment was never, w w wasn't an issue, basically, when, when, when the current federal system was established. Um, despite it obviously being a, a younger one than, than, than other countries. But having said that, perhaps because of that, it's enabled the, the, the federal system within Germany to, to become much more kind of entangled with each other than, than perhaps would have otherwise been the case. And so we do have this perhaps more cooperative um, approach than, than if everything is just dumped into one silo that, you know, that says climate policy or energy policy or whatever. So, because obviously it's a, it's a cross-cutting issue, as, as Sean was saying. It's not something that can just be addressed by one department anyway. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, and now uh, over to Araz and Lily. Uh, yeah, I can uh, like respond to that if Araz want to add. Uh, yeah. So um, about it, that's very good point about um, if there are some institutions or like other government agency or other agencies can help address the implementation issues. About the six um, environmental supervision bureaus, uh, after its implementation, what I know is that it actually, um, like, actually encouraged the local environmental policy implementation. I was talking to a friend who was working for provincial uh, environmental government agency, and she said because of this pressure, from the central government and um, then like local governments actually make a lot of efforts to like in this environmental policy implementation so when the central government um so when the representative from the central government came then can like show something so but i i didn't have like empirical evidence on that so did, i didn't write that in the paper um about either institutions we we will definitely dig into that and find. Um, so to start with, um, in China, it has all these environmental monitoring stations lo allocated, no, located at different like cities, provinces. Um, those environmental monitoring stations are very important to provide uh, like the data of uh, environmental quality. But then there are these issues that 
some local governments would actually cover those environmental monitoring stations so their environmental quality would look better. And because of that, the central government decided to centralize the ownership of all those environmental monitoring stations. Um, I'm sure there are also other institutions that may relate to um, have these implementation issues. So thank you for the comment. I'll definitely look into that. Um, and about the framework that um, Prof mentioned about the our glass framework. Uh, thank you very much for that. I actually didn't know about that before. And if you have other framework, um, please, it, uh, it, yeah, um, yeah, you can, uh, sorry. Uh, I would really appreciate the advice on other framework that may be useful to analyze the implementation. So far, we don't have very structural framework for that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Lily, and I'm sure we could um, exchange uh, on those ideas from, from George and, and myself and perhaps others that might want to input uh, offline. Thank you uh, so much. Um, over to uh, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, many thanks for your uh, comments, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Stegers. Um, I think you're right. Uh, my first interest, which is the one that led me towards this research, uh, was in para diplomacy. Um, Quebec and California are two cases exceptionally interesting on this subject. Now, it, in this preci precise uh, research, uh, along with a more causative approach uh, of the policy process involving, for instance, process tracing, uh, a first step will be to realize a similar discourse analysis in case studies on cases of societal identities, like the ones of, uh, of Texas, uh, Alberta, or Flanders, that are more um, attuned to economic liberalism uh, and maybe less inclined to implement uh, climate regulations. Uh, it would, I think, um, help to, def to defend some of my theoretical claims and probably lead to new insights uh, as well. Um, I would also like uh, to expand the number, the number of uh, pro-climate cases as well, eventually, for instance, to New York State, or even maybe to New York City or the city of Montreal, which have their own identity issue, namely pertaining to climate change. So uh, that would be uh, first steps. Uh, and thank you again, and have a nice day, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Charles. Um, we might just take, uh, I know we're, we're slightly over time, but um, we might take a few extra minutes if there's any discussion that wants to happen uh, anywhere. Uh, we have a, a few participants um, from outside as well. So if there are any questions, please uh, do do uh, feel free to just chime in and ask a question of, of anyone. May I? Please. Um, the, um, my question is about the German paper to, to uh, our colleague, Dr. Eckersley. I just wanted, I, I didn't quite get a clear picture of how much Germany's system of administrative federalism, whereby a lot of policies made nationally and, and administered with some degree of consistency by the lender, how much that constrained the lender from going their own way on climate change policy. Now, perhaps that's answered when I read the paper, but but if you could dilate a little bit on that, it would be good. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the, the point I, I, I do try to make in the, in the paper is that there is only a limited amount of things that the lender can do. And when it comes to strategic transportation systems, um, energy transmission systems, uh, Climate, um, you know, climate targets, you know, things like coal phase out is a big issue in Germany. The, the federal government has said that they won't phase out the burning of coal until 2038. Um, and so that means, of course, that the, 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 the coal states are quite, quite happy with that situation, that they can carry on doing that until then, um, even if other parts of Germany think that, that actually it's, that's not a very good idea at all. So, um, so yeah, there's still. There's, there's not very much that the lender are in control of, I suppose, is, is, is what I'm saying. 
Um, most of it is decided, and and of course, Germany sits within the European Union as well. And so, things like the emissions trading scheme is something that that's you know outside the control of even the federal government. So, um, so it's not really something that that the that the states have a great deal of influence over, um, other than setting their own targets and then also working with their municipalities within within their areas as well because they're, they're responsible for local government so they certainly what we've seen in the case of baden-württemberg is much more support for, for for municipalities to develop their own strategies and whether that's around energy policy around um, heat use and this kind of thing than than in many other states so that's that's why we're seeing this increase in fragmentation um so at the the sub-state level um as well as in the state level but the, the states themselves are, are quite limited in their in their capacities so just to clarify, in the area of local government, that's where they have their autonomy, policy autonomy, and yeah. that's where it plays out in terms of climate change. That's yeah, to a large extent. That's, that's, yeah. the, that's the main area where, where we've seen the, the big difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any other questions from uh, anyone? Uh, and for those that might be um, listening in, please do ask a question in the questions or room chat uh, features of, of this um, portal. So yeah, I'd like to ask a question, uh, the, the Swiss colleagues, if that's okay. Um, I thought it was really interesting in your presentation. I suppose I was interested yeah. particularly to know whether you did uh, the level of analysis that you did of the um, the strategies and the policies that the municipalities had developed on climate change, whether um, it, it, it seemed, you know, you were basing your analysis on, on these two um, master's dissertations, which were uh, focused almost on the existence of the plans rather than necessarily what was in them. Um, I don't know if, if you came across significant divergence between different municipalities in Switzerland, whether they may also be associated with the different cantons within which they were located or local political interests within within those municipalities. I don't know if you can get more in, info on that. Yeah, I think this is probably a question that uh, goes into my direction. Um, yes, actually, um, I think I showed that in the presentation very briefly. Indeed, those cities that were located in cantons that had already existing policies were also the ones that are with a le um, more likely those uh, that had uh, also the energy label. So there is a connection between like the different levels. Yeah. Okay, so um, if there's no further questions from anyone, give it another few seconds. Um, Whilst uh, people might be uh, coming up with a question that they have for our colleagues, I uh, would like uh, again to thank everyone for their participation. I think um, it would be uh, good to, to and correct to mention the support that we've received from the Quebec government to be able to host this kind of discussion. Um, it's been very useful and we're very grateful to the Secretariat of Canadian um, Relations for their support and the government of Canada, of, beg your pardon, the government of Quebec. Any other questions at all? It's good, Phil. Okay, so it's wonderful to see you all. Um, it's been a really, really interesting discussion. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, enjoy your day. Enjoy your swim, uh, Malena. And um, uh, Professor uh, Fenner, enjoy uh, whatever it is. I think you've got a bottle there behind you, so maybe that's uh, on the card. <laughs> I'd rather have the bottle in front of me than a frontal bottle. <laughs> But uh, I really have appreciated all your time. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Um, and we think we have everyone's email address. So if we need to follow up with any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to contact myself or George or any one of you. Um, thanks, everyone. And uh, have a wonderful day, evening, uh, or afternoon. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you guys very much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.